Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm sitting in for Sandy Mason tonight. We have got an awesome group of experts here tonight to answer your gardening questions. We are all chomping at the bit to get out in the garden. The weather finally seems to be agreeable. And so if you've got some questions that you want to ask tonight's panelists, go ahead and call now, 217-333-3495 and we'll just get started here doing a little introduction so you know who's here and what kind of questions to ask. So first we have Don White. Yes, I'm Don White. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Plant Pathology from the University of Illinois. And while I was at the university, I taught introductory plant pathology to a lot of students <laughs> and diseases of field crops and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses and did research on corn with emphasis on genetic resistance. I got Retired and got bored, so I became a master gardener, and I'm thoroughly enjoying that. Oh, thanks, thanks, Don. Did you have an email to answer tonight? Oh, yes. You want me to do that sure. now? Sure. We have one here from Randy. It's a blue spruce, and he says that he planted blue spruce uh, three years ago, and they appear to be developing a blight. And he's right, <laughs> because what happens uh, you got a lot of dead tissue. If I had a microscope and a dissecting scope, I could probably figure that out a little bit better. But there's a blight that's Rhizosphera needle cast. And that has almost seems like it came out of nowhere several years ago. It's just getting worse and worse. It, uh, what it does is it kills needles. And what will happen, the needles that are currently at the end of those little branches that look alive, They've already been infected by the fungus. So in the spring, when your new growth comes out of that branch that looks good, the part that looks good dies. The fungus produces spores on the looks good part <laughs> and then infects the part that just grew out. And it's, it's almost impossible to deal with. You can spray fungicides. Chlorothalonil is probably the best bet there. And you should be thinking about spraying now. Mm -hmm. and then shortly thereafter. But the problem is a lot of times people have these blue spruce out uh, in windbreaks and places like that and you just really can't get a sprayer to them. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody come in and spray them, it's awfully expensive. I think that there's some of them that are resistant because I've seen some places where several of them will be diseased and look bad and then one other one will look good. So there's probably a lot of difference in genetic susceptibility. Sure. No, thanks, and you might want to think about it too. Once people hear that you have to spray every year, they usually kind of think twice about whether they want to keep that tree or not. Yeah, I, yeah, that pruning at the base of the plant might come in handy, or <laughs> yes. I think I go to other spruce now. I used to be a big fan of blue spruce, but now I'm not. Oh, now you heard it from the expert, folks. <laughs> Switch from blue spruce. <laughs> and next, Kelly, what did you bring for us tonight? Um, my name is Kelly Alsup and I am a horticulture educator and I serve Livingston McLean in Woodford County. Uh, my expertise lies in greenhouses, house plants, and for the state, integrated pest management, which is a big fancy title for killing bugs. Um, my passion lies in beneficial insects and pollinators, but today I brought an interesting plant because, you know, we're it, we, uh, we're all going and grabbing the pansies because now that it, hopefully it won't freeze mm -hmm. again. Uh, this is a really cool, uh, cool season uh, annual that could be a great alternative to pansies. Um, it's called Sinetti and it is a hybrid from Japan. It's a mix between a daisy and an aster. Um, after uh, 80, once it hits 80 degrees, it declines. It's no longer uh, going to flower in your garden, but the flowers can fade. You can pinch them back and it, you'll get a new flush of flowers. And it actually smells really good. I can like, the aroma is almost taking me over right now. Oh, cool. But, but I am right up on it. <laughs> and it's really pretty, right? Yeah, Jennifer? it is. And I commented to Kelly, now I know why uh, the plant didn't last in my garden. I didn't realize it's a cold season annual, so you never know what you're gonna learn on Mid-American Gardener. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Jim, what did you have for us? Well, I think if any of you have traveled throughout the Midwest, you're well aware that many of our pine trees are dying. And they're dying uh, from a disease called pine wilt disease. And how the tree gets this disease, it's transmitted 
by the, a beetle, and I brought in this beetle. This is called the Carolina Pine Sawyer. The adult beetle is probably about three-fourths of an inch long. They're sort of brown in color. They have these long antennae. And uh, what, what happens is that um, when, let's just pretend that this is a carrier of the nematodes. The nematodes are found within the breathing pores of the, of the insect. So they're just chucked in there, just packed in there. And then when this beetle feeds on a healthy pine, the, uh, and it has to be just under ideal conditions. If it's wet with rain uh, on, the, on the branches, the nematodes leave the body of the beetle and enter that feeding wound. And then they multiply in the plant very, very rapidly. And in a matter of about three or four months, the plant already starts to decline. And by another year, the plant is dead. And then uh, the females of this beetle will lay their eggs on those trees that died. And if they died of pine wilt, the nematodes are in the tree. And then when the new generation of these beetles emerge from such a tree, they're also infected then with these uh, nematodes. The nematodes are only about a, oh, about a 30th of an inch in length. So that makes them very, very tiny. Uh, they are visible with the naked eye, but it's difficult to see. Sure. And uh, anyway, it's caused the death of a large number of our pines, particularly scotch pine. Scotch, red, and Austrian pine are very susceptible. Mugo pine is also susceptible. So uh, it's probably best not to plant those kind of pines. I was in Champaign, Illinois today, and I did not see one live scotch pine tree, not one. Oh, wow. So they pretty well eliminated the scotch pine. And uh, so it's a very serious, now as far as control, the best method to get rid of those, I would, any time a pine tree dies, cut it down to ground level and convert those logs and branches to chips. Or if you can't do that, then at least get it down to ground level and then burn that wood because you don't want the beetles emerging from, and you don't want to store that wood because eventually the beetles will emerge from the wood. So it's a, it's a very, very serious problem. When the beetles, uh, when the adult females lay their eggs, they'll chew the bark, and here's what, what it looks like. They make a little depression in the bark, and they chew that depression, and then they lay their egg in that depression underneath the bark. So if you see this on a tree, and I think you'd, you'll see that marking, if the tree is dead, they'll lay their eggs in that kind of a situation. Anyway, it's a very serious problem. Wow, good information to know and answers the mystery of why all the trees are dead. Oh, yeah, Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, before we get into calls this evening, I want to mention that we have the Mid-American Gardener podcast. If you just can't get enough of our show and you want to tune in in between Thursday nights, uh, Mid-American Gardener podcast is at midamericangardener.org or on iTunes, Stitcher, or NPR One. Uh, you can also... Um, you can tune in anytime. This week was episode seven. Uh, Master Gardener from Champaign, Kay Carnes, was the guest. So uh, tune in and get some more information uh, when you're not watching the show. Uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and get into the calls. But if you have a burning question, call us, 217-333-3495. We're going to go to line two. Logan from Springfield has a question. Hi. Yes, I... Um bought a little Venus flytrap plant, and uh, when I went to plant it, they recommended I use distilled water or rainwater, but I'm not so sure it's going to be a very wet summer this year, and I was wondering how long it takes for tap water left out in the open in an open container to at least become reasonably dechlorinated uh, to use instead of rainwater or distilled. Any thoughts? I, I want to say 24 hours. I was going to say 24 hours, too. And the, it's the fluoride, The fluoride too. may be a problem, too. And unfortunately, you can't get the fluoride out of the water. And you may find that your Springfield municipal water has fluoride added to it. It may or may not be a problem with Venus flytrap. I'm not sure. I actually bought one today, too. So I'm going to have to go <laughs> research that myself. My five-year-old spotted one, and we had to bring one home. Um, no, that's a good question, but I would say at least 24 hours and start collecting rainwater. And, you know, like with orchids, um, I just go out and buy the distilled water because I don't want the plant damage. So there you go. it might be, you know, something you invest a little bit more money in. 
It's not very much for a gallon of distilled water. That's a good point. Right. So thanks a lot for your question. I hope we helped a little bit. Uh, we're gonna go to line three. Stan from Champaign has a question about his sweet gum tree. Go ahead, Stan. I have a sweet gum tree and I'm interested in stopping the spiny ball. Ah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone wanna chime in? Well, I think you got one choice and that's just make one cut right at the base of the plant. Because <laughs> you're not gonna be able to get a, find a way to stop them that I know of. Oh. There is a product called Florel, but you have to spray it every year and it has to be sprayed in a very specific window and you have to hire someone to do it. And I, it's way last, up in there, you'll yeah, never get it's it. In the, yeah, you have to get someone with a bucket truck and a sprayer and be able to touch the top of the tree and it, it may or may not work. And it just goes to show you that even though sweet gum has really gorgeous fall color, when you're picking <coughs> out a tree, it's really important to think about everything that goes into mm -hmm. picking out that tree and is it going to be a messy tree is mm -hmm. it going to have some issues in the future and you may, may may or may not planted it on purpose but in the future you know think about some of those things and really do your research on yeah. a tree um, but i love sweet gums because mm -hmm. they're really beautiful fall color they are and Stan, I bet there's a lot of people that wish they'd pick sweet gum over green ash. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is very true. So all trees have their pluses and minuses. Uh, thanks, Stan. Uh, we're going to remind uh, people right now, this is your chance to get on the bus. Saturday, June 9th, 2018, uh, Mid-American Gardener fans get an opportunity to go on a bus trip with Sandy Mason and take a trip to Missouri Botanical Gardens. And you'll have a great day at the at the 79 acre St. Louis Botanic Gardens. And this trip is available for uh, a thank you for your donation of $150 or more to Illinois Public Media. And that's just $12.50 a month if you're looking for a way to rationalize it. Uh, do it that way and go on this trip. You'll have a great time. I've been there. They're shopping. There's beautiful plants. It's everything a gardener could ask for and you'll be able to ask Sandy all the questions that you've had stored up. She'll be a captive audience for you. Uh, so visit will.illinois.edu slash will travel today. So let's go back to the calls. Uh, we've got a call around line four. Nancy from Pena. Go ahead. Yeah. Go can ahead, Nancy. Yes, I can hear you. What's your question? Okay. I have a, um, about a five and a half foot ficus, and it has probably 99% of its leaves within the last few days. It has had a uh, sticky substance, made the leaves a little shiny, mm -hmm. and there's little bitty dots of dark brown, black, but <laughs> It's, like I said, my main concern right now is these that it's lost. I'd like to say that I've had it for seven years. It was like three, three feet tall when I got it, and it's now about five and a half foot. Okay. I can scale. see some nodding heads, yes. <laughs> it's definitely scale. Scale is a insect that puts its mouth part into um, the phloem of the plant and it can't break down the sucrose so it comes out in the form of honeydew which is this sugary sticky substance your telltale sign that you have scale um, the first thing that I would personally do and it may scare you is cut it back and just get rid of all the infected tissue um, another thing that you could do is if you didn't want to put a particular chemical on it would be to wash off the leaves or, you know, use a bit of alcohol with a Q-tip. Um, but, you know, that would be something that, you know, you'd have to be committed to. Or, you know, there are some chemicals out there, um, you know, uh, like a systemic uh, imidacloprid or something like that, that would definitely be the, the, 
the pesticide would be taken up into the plant and kill the scale immediately. Um, but I know telling somebody to cut back <laughs> their plant is crazy. Another thing, you could put it outside um, after um, it starts to ma maintain a 50 degrees and you might get some beneficial insects to help clean up the rest of that problem because you know sometimes a scale may not be that big of an issue when it's outside but we do have an entomologist sitting next to us and we would be remiss not to get his take on it well kelly i think everything you said i totally agree with you and i think that an idea of putting it outside is a very good idea because you will get mm -hmm. ladybird beetles will feed on the uh, young scales, and also uh, some of the parasitic wasp will mm -hmm. be there too. Uh, another thing you could do now though is spray it with a uh, soap spray. And uh, you'll never get rid of them all that way, but if you do it about maybe four times at about maybe every 10 or 12 days, a soap spray, uh, you'll get rid of the young ones. Uh, you could take a soft toothbrush though and remove all the large scales that you see. They're big brown scales, or sometimes they're tan in color, and just scrape them off with a soft toothbrush. That would help a lot too. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple suggestions that you could use. So it sounds like she's got a little bit of work on her hands, uh, but great tips. I promise, even if you cut it back and there's not a single green leaf left, you will get new regrowth. Um, it's just a very vigorous grower. Yeah, ficus does have a way of surviving. Uh, it does, can lose all its leaves mm -hmm. and come back. Uh, let's go take another call from line two. Laura from Springfield has a question about trees. Hello. Hi. This is sort of a weird question. Sure. Um, I've got two acres, and um, which is hard to take care of these days. Sure. But I have these, I don't know what they're called. I call them wild trees. <laughs> they just come up everywhere. <laughs> and you cut them down and uh, they, you know, start growing branches again from the, from the little, the trunks are only, I mean, I can, they can get better, bigger, but they're only like two, three inches around. And they're just everywhere. And I just don't know what they are. I heard somebody today um, tell me that he calls them uh, skunk trees, <laughs> but wow. hmm. I have no clue. And I know you guys have probably seen them or had them. I mean, they'll grow anywhere. There's a whole lot of trees that fit that bill. Yeah. yeah. I think you should take a picture and send it to your local master gardener office and have them identify it for you personally knowing what kind of tree is the biggest battle. Mm -hmm. However, if we knew how to get rid of some of these invasive species, we would be millionaires sitting up here. It can be <laughs> yes. a huge challenge to get rid of those. I think, um, you know, the naturalists, they, they burn, they cut and spray. What else can you think, Don, that yeah, naturalists might do? And Scrape, scrape the bark with uh, a fish scaler and then paint on Roundup and 2,4-D. Yeah. It works pretty good. Okay. Well, you need to know which, what it is, though. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, that is the first step. Uh, we still have some time for callers, 217-333-3495, but let's go for another round of emails and try to... Oh, yes, some I've some got a good one here. Way. Don? Jim sent in an email. He's got some hosta plants that... Uh, he's tra he traveled from Chicago to Cincinnati, and now they're in normal. And then they started acting badly. <laughs> uh, basically, the disease, the symptoms of this disease are, it's uh, anthracnose. It's a very common disease on hosta. And uh, basically what we have with anthracnose, you've got a fungus that forms a flat structure. I made one out of wadded up paper, <laughs> that'll work. And the spores are produced on the the paper and they're held in a mass and that mass then what has to happen you have to get water to dissolve the liquid that holds the spores together and then the spores are disseminated by splashing okay then the spores have to lay in water for a while before they can germinate so what happens anthracnose disease is a wet weather disease there's anthracnose on lots and lots of plants but they're not the same fungus now what will happen, I, in the photographs that he's got, 
there's one of them that shows a nice green yard. So I got a sneaking suspicion they're irrigating, mm -hmm. water in the grass, particularly last year, and that provides water for the anthracnose on the hosta. So what you got to do, if you're going to water the grass and the hosta at the same time, of course, you need to water early in the morning. That way you'll have a chance for the leaves to dry out a little faster. Do not water in the evening because then they're going to stay wet all night and this fungus is going to have a good old time. Also, you can use fungicides and uh, if you don't want to get your own sprayer, there's ready to use fungicides even though that looks like a pretty good little stretch of bed to be spraying that way. So that's about it. Okay. You should be able to spray and kill them. Well, thanks, Don. Kelly, did you have another email we could get? I, I did. I, I, I wrote an article last fall about debunking the myths of planting spring bulbs because most people may disagree or agree with me, but horticulture is always changing. We're always learning something new. And this is what I was always taught in college, and I'm sure Jennifer and the rest of us have always heard, that you wait until tulip, uh, daffodil, and hyacinth bulb foliage naturally dies. You don't do anything with it. However, studies, recent studies have shown you only have to wait three to six weeks to get rid of that mm -hmm. foliage. That it actually um, has put all that energy back into the bulb. So you don't have to, I've seen master gardeners, you know, curl them and tie them. You, and, and they look really ugly in your landscape, right? So just know that if you wait three to six weeks, to cut those back, you don't have to wait until they naturally ripen. I um, mean, and you know, the smaller bulbs, you don't have to worry about that type of foliage, but um, you don't have to worry about next year's. And then another thing is, um, if you like, if you want to ensure that the uh, bulb um, has a great flower display for next year and gets all that, um, um, energy back into the bulb. Once it flowers, you go ahead and you take the flower off because otherwise it's going to try to produce a seed head and put energy into seed head rather than energy into the bulb. Oh, great tips. We tried that at our house and we had daffodils that were um, still green around 4th of July, but taking them out at six weeks didn't hurt them one bit. So no, great and tips. It, gardeners always hate the look of that foliage yeah. afterwards. Jim, did you have another uh, email a real for quick us? one here? Yeah. We, we had a, a email from Sandy in Springfield, and she's got a problem with chiggers. So, Sandy, I think I would contact a, a commercial operator, a pest control operator, and see if they could spray your lawn with a chemical called permethrin. So, I think they'd be probably familiar with that material. It's a very safe material to use, but uh, chiggers can really be a problem. Some people are susceptible to it. I'm very susceptible to chigger bites. Get rig wilts and they, mm -hmm. they itch like mad for about two days. So uh, it's caused by a mite, very tiny mite. Actually, some of you gardeners probably have seen the adult. They're bright red. Mm -hmm. You see them in the soil. Mm -hmm. So that's the adult chigger. And they'll lay eggs and then they'll develop. And so it's a real problem. But I think I would c consult a commercial pest okay. control operator and spray your Great. entire lawn. Great, yeah. great tips. We're going to have time for a quick call from Johnny in Lincoln has a question on a mountain ash tree. Yes, and thank you so very much for your wonderful program. We enjoy it so much. Oh, thanks for watching. Uh, we have a mountain ash, and uh, it's several years old, and we noticed um, this spring, um, oh, well, actually around March, um, um, that there were all over the ground, um, like like the tree is chipping. Um, is is that is that the boar, or could it be the mountain ash borer? The emerald ash borer doesn't attack mountain ash. Mm -hmm. no, right, mountain ash is not fractious and sorbus. If I'm not mistaken, which I I hope I don't regret saying this, but doesn't mountain ash, as it grows older, doesn't the bark become a little bit more mottled? 
I'm not. I'm not I sure. I wish I had the. Um, that is something definitely. Again, you could go to your local master gardener to get a for sure answer. Um, I'm thinking it's a natural process, but um, you could always look for holes in the bark. Right. Um, that's a that's a good point. That's a stump the panel question for tonight. So, yeah. Does it, it look like it's going to come out though? Are you starting to get leaves bud swelling? Actually, we can we can see like I'm sitting right here at the um, at the window, and I can see where this bark came off. But are the buds the new growth? Um, you know, there are not a whole lot of buds on this tree. Uh -uh. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sure say that take that to your local extension office and see what they can do with some samples. Uh, but we unfortunately have got to end tonight. And if you've still got some burning questions and want to get on a future uh, show or on the podcast, call our voicemail, 217-300-8224. You can call us 24-7. So when you wake up in the middle of the night with that burning question, call our voicemail and just thank you so much for all your calls tonight and you kept us hopping and get out in the garden and we'll uh, tune in next time.